So, hi, welcome to Glug's Creative Lunch Hour. This is part of MediaTel Events Future of Gaming event that you're watching live today. This is a pre-recorded segment, but um, uh, I'm sure you've been having a really good time this morning watching all the various different things that have been coming out. My name is Pete Bowker. I'm the CEO of Glug Events, and I'm delighted today to be joined by Cy Crowhurst, who is the Vice President of Bungle Creative Labs. Hi, how are you doing, Cy? Hi, Pete. Uh, glad to be here today. Nice to see you too, um, albeit virtually, um, Absolutely. which is a new normal for us. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, so we're going to be talking about gaming. Obviously, Bungle is a, a big name in the world of gaming, uh, uh, both as a sort of media platform in in-game advertising, uh, all sorts of different things like that. Uh, I'll, I'll set the tone by saying that we all know that I don't know an awful lot about this, as it's been the case with a lot of these conversations uh, we've been having. So really, you know, uh, uh, you're here to uh, to tell me a bit more about what's going on, to educate and uh, uh, um, and illustrate some of the things that are happening from your point of view and from Bungle's point of view. Uh, uh, during this extraordinary time. Um, sure. But I thought we'd start off, uh, uh, if you could just give us a little bit of background. Obviously, you know, we've known each other for a while, um, uh, uh, but for our viewers and listeners, can you give us a, a little bit of background on you, um, your career as it's been from mobile and into gaming, and, uh, and tell us a little bit about what it is you do there at Bungle Creative Labs. Yes, for sure, more than happy to. Um, so my, interestingly, my, my career has always been working within mobile. Um, so when I first started, you can probably see from the gray hairs, I'm, a, I'm in my 40s. Um, it was very much very early days, pre-iPhone. Um, I worked for a number of different co companies, including Orange, the operator in the UK, where I sort of led um, creative projects such as multimedia messaging and music services and things like that. Um, and then sort of span out from there to start my own mobile marketing agency with a couple of um, co-founders. And that was very early. That was sort of working with uh, on-pack um, SMS type promotions, if you remember those. So text this code to receive this gift. Um, and then the internet and then the iPhone launched around about that time, which was sort of game changing, as we all know. Um, and that really opened up a whole new world where you're building mobile sites, uh, mobile websites, which was very, very new. Um, pivoted from there to join another, you know, my sort of move into the advertising sector, as it were, with a company called Amobi. Um, so work on a number of different innovation sort of projects for key key customers. Um, and then came to Vungle, actually, six years ago. Um, and that's been a big, big sort of growth journey, really. Um, at Vungle, what we do is we're a performance marketing platform and we have publishers, so app game developers. Um, or developers, as, as, as it were, that build games and look to monetize those games um, via advertising. And then on the other side of that sort of um, environment is the advertiser that's looking for people like uh, a certain cohort or demographic, and they're looking to um, a, a, attract them and then convert them to be people that play their regular games. Yeah, that's really cool. I can't believe it's been six years you've been at Vungle already. That's uh, I know. time has flown. <laughs> it has indeed. It really has. So, so uh, obviously, a lot of people watching will know quite a lot about the gaming world, but there'll be some of us that don't really know. Um, I, when we were, have been chatting recently, we've been talking a little bit about the scale of that market. Um, uh, it's absolutely enormous, and I don't it's think huge. that uh, you know people really yet have completely understood uh, uh, this, a, the scale of that market as a sort of media and publishing um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, space, you know, that's content that's going out there within gaming. Um, uh, uh, but, you know, also how global it is. Can you tell me a little bit about, you know, just some of the numbers that are involved? We're talking billions of people that are engaged in this market. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, on the Vungle, if, if you look at gaming as a whole, it's a massive industry. And I think it's come through some shifts of perception in terms of like who might be those gamers, you know, sat here with um, with a beard and sort of sandals on right now. And I think the old sort of misconceptions of the audience are is it's heavily male and people in basements, you know, in the dark playing games. And we know from lots of studies and lots of sort of analysis that that couldn't be farther from the truth, particularly when we start to think about mobile gaming. And you might think of some big titles that people, that are household names such as Candy Crush, Soda Saga, you know, titles like that from King, where that's heavily female um, and, and older than you would think in terms of kids. It's much more in the 
in the midterm demographics of like 30 year old mums playing games. So this misconception has really been a shift, which I think is super interesting. But in terms of the market, I mean, this is a creative sort of um, seminar and I don't want to just come here and quote numbers and sound, you know, to, to devalue that, but it's, it, you know, it's something like $152 billion market. And if you look yeah. at mobile gaming's chunk of that, it's 45% of it. So that's quite, it's, it's, it's quite impressive. And in particular, when you see what's, what's happened as a natural byproduct of that, you've seen like private equity and governments take interest in it and start to invest in, in those sort of companies that make up the ecosystem. So some of the big gaming titles have been bought by private equity funds. And then some of the companies, you know, Vungle being one, two acquired by Blackstone. Um, you've seen our nearest competitor, Atlovin, um, acquired by KR, KKR. Um, and you're starting to see that space really sort of move into more mainstream and even governments like, look, in, you know, the UK trade initiatives of having a fund for gaming companies to encourage that sort of ecosystem in London, which is massive too. Yeah, it's extraordinary that, isn't it? I mean, uh, you know, I, I think I, as, as someone who hasn't traditionally been a gamer, you know, mm. I didn't really get into that stuff. I think back in the early 80s, I think I had one of these little fold out Donkey Kong games when yes. I was a kid. That's really the last, the, the, the last time I spent any time playing computer games. But even just, obviously not at the moment, but traveling on the tube, you think about it, you know, there's a high proportion of the people on their daily commute who are playing mm. mobile games, you know, in, in a variety of different guises. You know, it seems to be, I don't know, I would say, uh, uh, don't quote me on this, but a third of the people standing there, you know, listening to music, a third of the people watching something, watching one of their um, uh, series, and, and, and another third of people seem to be playing games. Like you say, those are male, female, young, old, every kind of background, every kind of uh, uh, persuasion of person, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And you, yeah, that, that's surprising. That really is surprising. Um, so then specifically, obviously, Vungle Creative Labs, um, you know, the, yes. you guys are involved. You know, this is this is the creative lunch hour after all, as we said, um, you're involved. Uh, you're involved not just in um, uh, uh, the kind of the data side of things or, or, or the, uh, uh, the, the buying and strategy side of things, but actually in the creation of um of advertising that goes in games and sort of uh, gamification i suppose of some of those things uh, mm -hmm. how long has that been going as part of bungle has that been there from the start you know how, how how did that come about yeah so i mean the company started founded in 2011 in london and in 2013 the decision was made to sort of to sort of start an experiment in essence like can you blend like creativity the composition of the ads people see with 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 data because remember we're a performance platform so people that spend money are really looking to track that now performance can have a dirty word some a dirty connotation sometimes but i think it's if you look at the particular time now we're in with covid19 you really see that all those eyeballs indoors forced indoors um, are, are really consuming that and really playing that. And you've seen, you know, I think other areas of advertising and brand world, you've seen budgets probably sort of pause at best. Yeah. Um, we haven't seen that as an industry. We haven't seen that. We've seen that continue, that, that spend to continue because it's very measurable and very trackable. Um, as it pertains to Creative Labs, so we started with that experiment and we really do break down Creative Labs into three areas. So it's really strong creative talent. The, uh, you know the creative direction art direction um copywriting of, of, of these ads you've then got this notion of using creative tech as we call it the technology that powers so simplicity put that's removing manual repetitive tasks so if you need to localize an ad into a thousand languages you don't really want to be doing that manually so we've built an example of our creative tech is to look is a localization so insert language a and use the technology to to filter that out and, 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 and allow you to traffic many, many different versions of languages and some pretty weird languages down to Swahili and things like that, right. which sort of drives the reach you can get, you know, globally. Um, and then the third piece is obviously data. So, you know, I was watching your um, the Future of Media session, they're talking about like data can be blinding. I, I, I sort of agree with that notion. Um, I think a right amount of data is really important. So we're always looking to because we can see the size of our network, we can see data in real time, we're always just looking, is this creative resonating with its audience, target audience? Mm -hmm. Can we try some different things? Can we move some dials simplistically, you know, bring some different composition into the into the creativity? And it and, and it does work. 
Yeah, it's interesting you know, you're saying, you know, referencing that film, uh, which was aired a couple of weeks ago, mm. uh, talking with Dan uh, and Orlando. And, you know, one of the things we were talking about there is, you know, the pure creativity and how the data enhances that or can inform it. But actually, it is just that is, it, you know, it's, it's informative rather than instructive, as it were. You yes. know, it just kind of gives you the ability to to pivot and that creativity I, you know I, I know you, you agree is still fundamental that human creativity that's involved yeah. uh, in this that's you know the nature of that empathy that level of design that level of creative skill and talent that's gone in that you know you can teach AI an awful lot of things but it can't go for five years to art school you know or, or, or whatever and uh, that really makes a big difference. Um, so we've got a sort of series of, uh, of topics to talk about during our conversation today. Um, you'll see me sort of looking down, I have some notes here. Um, uh, uh, so excuse me for that. But I've got a couple of sort of main questions really to start off with. Um, you know, there are, there's a pandemic going on at the moment. It's changing the world. It's obviously in the short term changing everyone's world, uh, you know, in their, in their private sense. Most of us are working from home. Most uh, uh, most of the creatives that we're talking about, in terms of designers and illustrators, animators, uh, people who you know make creative stuff on computers, are working from home. Um, yeah. But actually, there's a long-reaching um, impact of this whole thing beyond we even get, getting into the conversation about whether people keep working from home, but actually mm -hmm. about how you do creative. So I, I'm kind of interested in what you think perhaps the key lessons from the pandemic um, for creatives across all sectors are, you know, how, how our understanding of brand identity um, and social purpose might have changed in the light of that ongoing crisis. You know, what, what as creatives should we be doing to react to that and how, how is that changing things? Yeah, it's a really good question. It's something, something we've thought long and hard about from day one you know the decision to go into lockdown seemed relatively straightforward now even that was quite a shock at the time um i think in to your question which is how do you continue creativity and collaboration and all those bits and pieces whilst you're in this sort of time and there's many different tidbits and people have come up with some really creative ways to encourage that you know online collaboration tools even if you comment this is lovely into a creative piece of design you know a quarter of the way through it's that sort of social you know it's that validation mm. that you get similarly with these zoom calls I, li I like it when people are writing chats and waving or thumbs up as in terms of that and you know showing that people are engaged and listening yeah but i think in terms of like the situation we're in it's hard to it's hard to give a de facto you know definitive answer now because it's still relatively uncertain times and it is involving and in flux um, but we do believe it's never been more important to get the right message to people um, using the, the tools that we have available in which they're engaging with right now, right? So bringing it back to the game, gaming environment where we work, you know, it's no lie that people are staying indoors playing more games. And in doing that, they are consuming more, more advertising as a byproduct of that very activity, right? Um, and we've, we've had a few different initiatives actually. So be it some of our advertisers, you know, dating apps, you know, it's sort of real change in that sort of call to action, okay. right? Meet me in the X outside venue has gone away. So massive shift in those sort of um, publishers, if you like, and the creative work we've had to do there to sort of encourage going online. And then similarly, we've got a number, number of different initiatives where we're seeing Pokemon Go, you know, the, the, the sort of our, the big sort of things was under London Bridge. And now it's like encouraging in your home environment or close to you. Um, but a few things we have seen, um, really interesting initiative that happened almost like day five of lockdown was this initiative with charities and a number of publishers in the UK. So we sort of had a thing, we were thinking ourselves about, you know, what philanthropy concept could we sort of get involved with and not in like oh look at us this is the right time to do this it's more around oh my god loads of people have been really impacted we have skills and techniques and technology and all these bits and pieces how can we bring that together and do something for, for the good of others particularly like charities like funding you know and the attention just turned off overnight right simplistically yeah, right. so we got together some publishers they saying they said to us we'd like to give away inventory for free and we we're like interesting okay brilliant well we'd like to give away the use of our platform um and we'd like to give away the creative as it pertains to my division we'd like to make creatives for free for charities 
and then a number of different charities came running saying can can you really support us in ads that can run on your network and we did that very thing my, one of my favorite charities we work with is a uk charity called make a wish and the reason i love this is using gaming gamification and gaming for people with severe disabilities as a way of like stimuli and a way of breaking up the day and channeling sort of attention and, and effort into those sort of environments um and then i was just on linkedin one day and i just saw um, a call out from the united nations a call to the creative mm. community and i'm sure many people on this listening to this uh, yeah. session right now would have seen that and the response has been amazing so we answered that and said look we think playable ads or, or interactive ads so what do i mean by that in a typical um advertiser you would recreate the level of a game so you can see that ad have a go play with it interact with it and see if you like it before you go through that process of downloading and all the cumbersome stuff with that and right. we've seen that as a really impactful way to to give something back because we picked two of the briefs and we answered it one is physical distancing so can you practice using gaming to stay two meters apart you know when i walk around the streets in london some people could do with playing that title i suggest <laughs> um, <laughs> but similarly as well there was um hygiene as well using a playable ad to mimic the the steps in a really thorough hand wash mm. um and from the data we've seen and running these ads people are really engaged with them and they're trying and they repeat trying um and i'm sure they're washing their hands better as a as a direct outcome of that it's a, it's an extraordinary thing that i mean I, i've seen a couple of those things that you guys have put together you know just thinking about the uh, the washing your hands game, as it were, um, you know, one of the things that struck me is that that is, you talked before about using your technology to make things in different languages, but one thing which is consistent pretty much is a visual language. And, the, the you know, an animation that has, that shows you the actions that you should be doing in washing your hands doesn't need to be in Swahili, you know, or, or yes. in English or German or, you know, even American English, um, uh, you know, you can, uh, it, it, it is, it is sort of cross-continental, isn't it? You know, that's, and, mm -hmm. and good creative that works that way. We have some, you know, some, some pretty standardized notions visually uh, uh, that we can see that really just relate to our, our, our bodies and, 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 you know, sort of stick men avatars or whatever, um, which is an extraordinary thing, isn't it? You know, that, that yes. really is, you know creativity and visualization of things that uh, uh, that can add for some very clear messaging um you you talked about um inventory being made available to you then. so so just for clarity this is this is games that have got space uh, effectively media space um yes. within the game or within the preamble or whatever it is and that they're just offering that up they're saying instead of you buying this space to put your advert in you know we will give that freely um, yeah. uh, to these charities and, and and how does that work you know in, in a charity sense if a charity ad goes into that space do, do people have the ability to click out and to make a donation or to engage yeah. with the charity directly yeah that's exactly it so that sort of initiative uh, there's a there's a publisher in the uk called mini clip and, and and a guy there called peter really really strong guy that sort of drove this publisher initiative he's talking about like the one percent initiative can every publisher give one percent away in perpetuity which is an amazing outcome if that happens um yeah, but right. yeah absolutely the charity will come and say don't you know the call to action will be donate and you'll go off to their site and you will give funds towards that charity of your choice and we've got you know it's growing the number of i think we've got four, 50 publishers um wow. as of last night and i think we've got growing 26 advertisers and we're looking at ways to really help you know it might not be a surprise to you in the charity space that they don't necessarily have the technology to track all that you know there's if, if 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 impressions and donations are coming in all around the sort of digital and physical things they don't necessarily have the infrastructure to track where that came from and they can see that so we're helping them with that too yeah um, sure so i think it's a really good thing and it's you know and it's a, a lot of small charities too it, which is cool i mean all charities are amazing don't get me wrong but the yeah, smaller ones struggle for cut through um, and I think that's a really important aspect of it too. It's, it's an extraordinary thing as well, presumably, you know, looking at this space with an enormous reach with complete, you know, completely global market on many, many levels. Um, uh, uh, as we said, sort of cross-continental, uh, cross-linguistic cross um, uh, reach. 
I suppose the other element that I, that I hadn't really thought about much before is, you know, in the traditional TV advertising, for example, it's all well and good. You go and buy a slot that is a 30 seconds um, uh, uh, space, you know, in the middle of Coronation Street or, or you know, some enormous uh, 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 soak there. You're going to pay a chunk for that media just for the space to put your advert in. But also, actually, you're going to have to spend quite a lot of money. I mean, you know, I, I in my past, I was in uh, uh, the world of creating TV advertising on the front end, you know, running originally as an art director, but then running studios and all of that sort of thing. It's expensive. And even now where people can make an awful lot of stuff in the computer, you want to, you want to animate a, a 30 second spot. It's an expensive pursuit. Um, so. But actually, presumably that, you know, that, that is much more accessible from a cost point of view. I mean, obviously we're talking about charities having free slots and you guys very kindly giving over free creative for them to, to put into this slot. But even after that, you know, hopefully as we come out the other side of this, people will have engaged more as, you know, seeing gaming more as a, a as a media platform there. You know, yeah. what's, is there a kind of cost differential? You know, am I right in saying it's much cheaper to produce creative for advertising in these slots? I think, I think in general, yes. I think, you know, in, in our industry, we don't necessarily charge per se for the creativity or for the building of that we package that into the media buy right oh, okay. um so that comes with thresholds of course which you know we, we sort of look at but i yeah i do believe that you know the the friction to work in our in within that environment is less than it might be in a more traditional media outlet yeah. right and i think you know i think gamification historically going back to what we we're saying before just around like bad bad a word you know a, a word that might be frowned upon historically but i think you you can see how you can you can reward people for their efforts and you can track the engagement you can see what they're doing and you can sort of give different experiences around that further mm. down the line right so you could you, you could get in touch with people and then keep them and keep communicating with them which i think is really interesting so so that that true combination of you know the the the, the data the creativity and the technology coming all together not only giving you access to a bigger audience, but actually really driving engagement, you know, and continued yeah. engagement because you can be reactive, you can be agile about yes. how that's working. And I suppose uh, as well, you must pretty well know who it is you're talking to. You know, this is it, it, rather, we know the number of people that are sitting down to watch Coronation Street, but we don't necessarily know who exactly they are in the demographic. Whereas in this space, we know a lot more about the audience as well. We definitely know more about them. I mean, we do, you know, privacy is a huge thing. Um, yeah. You know, Apple are really leading that. So we don't know your Pete Boker age X, Y, Z, right? But we do know um, certain attributes of, 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 a, of an individual and then we group them, right? But we're very conscious about sort of knowing too much about sure. people and not, and not sort of, you know, GDPR is a huge one, right, in, in, in this sort of world. But yeah, we do, we do know more about people, um, which I think is really interesting and predictions around that as well you talked about algorithms before you know i think creativity sort of stands out in a space because if you are a media buyer trying to reach somebody who wants to play your game a lot of that is automated so mm. you can bid and then there's algorithms that optimize your bids for you as one example and we do believe that create that creative space can be automated to some degree to your point before but it's still yeah. that pure play you need ideas and you need concepts and you need to use innovative minds to sort of switch it up else you just get fatigue right we all see ads yeah. that are just like oh my god i've been seeing this for two years um, yeah right <laughs> and it keeps hitting yeah. you you know freshness you know because that that advertising is still part of the content you know it's it's, it is. it's yes. still part of what's there and it's got to be engaging you know the the, the golden age uh, old folk like me remember you know of, of tv advertising sometimes you'd be really looking forward to the adverts to see what was actually going to happen and you know there was yes. a lot of humor and comedy that was involved in it or you know just absolutely beautiful filmmaking you know um and i guess that's that 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 remains true into this space at all um so what do you think the the misconceptions about designing for gaming audiences are and the kind of missed opportunities around creative for mobile and digital formats you know what what, what are people not getting misconceptions i think 
so I touched on it a bit before, just in terms of who who who's playing games, right? And, and you just have this opinion that if it's you know if you're giving somebody a reward, it's a bribe, um, mm. which is a notion we've sort of combated ourselves in terms of you know media buyers. They're like, I don't want to give someone a reward for engagement; they'll just bribe, you know, they'll just mine the system just to get something. But we don't see that. We don't see that scale. And similarly to that, you know, we think time spent on mobile dev devices has outpaced all the other channels we're talking about. So it is the right channel, right? I think it's up to, where is it? People are spending more than 30 minutes a day in games. So, you know, when you think of, this has been a phrase that's been used a lot, you know, the top 10 apps you use, like gaming definitely appears there. And like Apple and Google, the app stores would tell you the lion's share of their revenue is coming from games alongside the Facebooks, the Instagrams, the Stravas, so on and so forth, that are like our hygiene go-to apps. Um, so I think it's the audience and the perception of it. And then I also think it's the fact that, you know, gamification isn't necessarily sexy, but I think it, it that we've proven it, the biggest performing sort of, as we see on the network, are those interactive playable apps, because you try something before you go through that effort of, 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 of having to go through the long steps to download it. And when I say long, you're talking 30 seconds, but you've got to click a button and then wait and watch the spinny circle and put your yeah. thumb, you know, all the things you know. Um, so th I think they're the two biggest areas that it's become more mainstream and then mm. couple it with the fact that people want to, people are interested in, in gaming now. You know, at GDC uh, last year, you know, this Apple, Google, they're all coming with these products um, to really tackle gaming. It's all these signals of intent that it's becoming something that people start to believe in and want to play, play, a, play a part in. Yeah, it's been, it's been a sort of a, a, a radical development and change in a really quite short period of time. I mean, you know, yeah. you're, you're talking about, you know, Bungle uh, 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 less than 10 years old, you know. Yes. And even in that time, you know, just radical, radical shifts. So I suppose, yeah, you know, for those of us outside the the, the pointy end of that, uh, there's a, there are yeah. some a lot of misconceptions around that. Um, yeah, it's uh, you know, do do for the creatives. Then, if I if I'm a um, a traditional creative, a graphic designer, an animator, um, you know, even a creative technologist, uh, you know, uh, to a degree. Um, do I do I need to know something more? Is there is there a another layer to my course that I need to do if I want to be engaged in, you know, the creativity area within advertising within gaming, or is there a sort of seamless shift across? You know, do you? I, I'm not sure how big the team you've got there at, at Bungle Creative Labs is, but there's certainly quite a few of you guys there now. Are they yes. coming to you from traditional graphic design, from traditional animation? from advertising or are they a whole new breed yeah so it's interesting so you have seen the the rise of the creative technologist and it's really fascinating to hire them actually because they can code very proficiently but they also have great levels of creativity mm -hmm. and that conceptual they sort of i think they all studied at school whereby not only do you come up with that concept you also you also build it and bring it to life which when i was studying many moons ago i wish there had been a course just like that Obviously, you know, you can see, see, see forward and stuff. But I think one, one thing we do see is, you know, we see a lot of um, people that send us their TV spot, you know, video, for example, and it doesn't work on our network. It doesn't, it doesn't engage the, the intended audiences. And we, we sort of talk about this. This comes into a fascinating area, which, which we're sort of looking into and pioneering in, in terms of our space, which is like this engagement taco. So, you know, it's, exciting. It's, not, it's not a new concept. Of course, film's been doing it for years and stuff, right? There's a start, there's an end in the middle bit, sort of, you can ignore if you believe the hype. Um, but we, we've also been looking at the, the, the world of neuroscience because we, we can track you know, we can, I, I always use the phrase behind the canvas, if you like, we can look at where people click and heat maps and so on and so forth. And that gives us really good data, right? But we've been running and before everyone gets carried away and this is sort of a terrible thing with privacy, like we, we ask, we invite people in, we wire them up to neuro um, biometric sensors. And then we can, we can look at what I call the front of the, on the front of the canvas, how people feel how they respond, where they look, their heart rate, their sort of facial expressions and stuff. And we're using that as an additional layer to sort of marry up um, our 
creative concepts and always look to look to optimize and improve there and it's a new field and it's not terribly scalable right now because you need to be in a lab and you need to be wired up um but it really is a fascinating area and it's adding an extra depth to our sort of insights and the, and, and the creatives that are involved in that and seeing the reactions i mean you know, we're, we're used to in traditional advertising you know audience testing uh, yes. you know and, yes. and 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 seeing what you know people filling on a piece of paper you know how did this make you feel when the yes. when the little girl ate the chocolate bar you know um uh, uh, this is like a step beyond isn't it but but the, the 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 creatives in your in your studios and in the labs there you know this is all just meat and wine for them presumably they're used to this kind of response and their understanding so in the same way that creative technologist who's very used to you know can draw and can code you know yes. to, to yes. simplify it yeah. um you know this is this is again just another area that of, of something to respond to and react to but that response is still a creative response it's still you know okay i've learned that that's how that makes them feel right. I know how to make them feel differently. Not, yes. you know, the, da the data says this, as it were. It's, it's it is, there's yeah. still a human response to that. Yeah, completely, completely so. And to your point, there's, there's 28 of us in Creative Labs now, mainly Lion Show in London, Asia, and the US. I mean, and it is traditional disciplines as well as that creative technology that highlighted one there. We've got illustrators, animators, we've got motion graphic artists, we've got 3D artists, we've got the standard sort of set. Mm. um if as you say but bringing them together into more you know with growth comes a nice a nice sort of problem that you get to work in more you know squads if you like as opposed mm. to like individuals when you're a small learner and everyone's just headphones on and, and busy 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 i'm sure a lot yeah. of sort of relates to that but you're really seeing that discipline and people i think one of the biggest challenges when i joined is like the the apprehension understanding of data we talked about it before but it really was a challenge to start yeah. with be like look at this look at this data report people be like what i don't want to do that <laughs> and, I, and I, you can relate to that too but uh, but that's blending those squads yeah. across yeah. Are blending you know uh, yeah. seamlessly now in a, in a way that they never have done before well we have dedicated uh, a team that's looking at data analysis and nothing else as it returns to the creative right yeah, we're at yeah, that sort yeah. of point now and they and that's wonderful to the creators because you free them up but they're interested and they want to know what's, what's emanating and what's working. And they're mm. asking those forward questions and they weren't five years ago, you know? Yeah, right. So, yeah. so how, do you think, how do you think then, you know, mobile gaming, the evolution of game design, you know, how has that impacted um, uh, the marketing and advertising worlds, traditional or, or otherwise? You know, what, what's, what are the big changes that you, you're seeing? Well, I think, think at a macro level, so three years ago, our network was all gaming. When, when I say our network, all the publishers and all the advertisers are all gaming. It's not the case yeah. anymore. You know, from dating apps, music apps, so on and so forth coming in on the publisher side, but similarly, those advertisers wanting to acquire users, crude term, but acquire users. Yeah. Um, so we see that shift. And we also know, like, the gaming guys in the big companies like Kings and the Peak Games and all you know all the games you can look at globally that are huge they hire really smart you know data people so they mm. they know where their budget their marketing budgets are going and they know what to do and they know how to optimize it right and where to spend at the right times so you're seeing that and i do believe you know i think you look at the typical funnel there's a whole world for brand brand marketing and we'd like to get into that in, in a more of a way mm. too but also there's, there's this blend, I think. And I wonder whether this, we touched on this before, I wonder if this crisis sort of, you know, lots, we've seen lots of things, you know, certain, certain things in, in industries have just elevated themselves by, or fast track themselves by five years, if you believe what you read, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, econ, bang, you know, <laughs> all those bits and pieces. I wonder if we see the same, the same thing. Um, yeah. Is it, is it gonna, you know, do, does it, t in that acceleration process, you know, when I started in the creative industry, you know, computers were something that you wrote an invoice on. But there were word yes. processors, really. Um, and <laughs> and then, you know, the internet was in existence, but we weren't all using it. You know, I remember a buddy of mine when I was first working, having the internet at home and doing surfing on the internet. And me just thinking it was the dullest thing you could possibly do, just sitting in front of the screen, waiting for some text to load. Yes. Cut to, you know, 10 years later and, you know, we were making TV commercials. We were doing all sorts of different things and people were saying, well, you know, this is going to be on the internet soon and that's going to take some of your budget cut to another 
10 years later. And sure enough, yeah, absolutely. You know, advertising spend, media spend was going online in a way that, you know, no one really thought about. Is this an acceleration process in that, in terms of that budgets being be, because of the reach, because of the, you know, the targeting, because of the, the agility uh, and creative response and that gelling together of all these various yeah. things? Does this do that? Does this stop people? I mean, you know, the outdoor industry, obviously it's quite difficult, you know, when no one's outdoors or no one's, yeah. you know, going next to you, going past your things, you would think the radio is probably doing okay, TV probably doing okay. But actually, if you're seeing engagement in content like gaming going up hugely, what does that do just to spend and consequently the concentration of the number of creatives working in a particular area? You know, is that... Yeah. Yeah, I agree with I, the, the way you summarise that. I agree. My my sort of philosophy is that we will see uh, a, a slingshot from this. Mm. Is my personal view, and there's sort of a read read a lot around this subject right now. Fascinating articles, you know, get sent articles from you know. This sounds dull, but it's true from the from the from the private equity worlds who are tracking this stuff like hugely, mm. as I sort of intimated on. So we do believe that that will be the case. Um, I think there's one step we can do within our particular, the way in which we're sort of delivering ads is, it's still a little bit like broadcast TV. We make a couple of concepts and we traffic it in the network and we might target by sort of cohorts, but it is a little bit like a TV spot, albeit targeted to a few cohorts. I think we could sort of go on a bit of a journey where we're sort of marrying. So say for example, you're playing a game and there are four characters and we see you engage in like one character we could probably jump you certain levels into the game you've just downloaded instead of you having to go from level one for it, as a random example, right? right? And I think that could be a really different sort of play in terms of how you just get people to the right places um, because it's just more context and, and con- you know, re- relevance there, I think. And, and is the sort of brands that are engaging with this sort of advertising, is it currently ubiquitous? Does it does it play better for a particular product, service, or brand? You know, you spoke momentarily ago about getting more into the just the general brand, old school wise. I would call it kind of brand awareness space. You know, where yeah. where you're actually promoting a specific brand rather than just a product or a service. But how how, how does it track? You know, is every brand in the world potentially a beneficiary of this change? Yeah, I'd argue. I'd argue you'll see some movement there again. Um, I think some of the principles and some of the ways in which we work with more performance-driven buyers are, are still relevant to, mm. to, to that wider sort of play. And I think if you look at online where you see, you know, you know this te- classic industry thing is consolidation. I've been talking about the investment coming in. The consolidation will happen. You, you, you see what I mean? And all of a sudden, mm-hmm. you're bigger companies covering more of the funnel, more of the dollars in, in, in advertising. And I think we're starting to see that now. But it's interesting times, isn't it? it? Absolutely fascinating. It so, so, you know, finally, really, I'm interested to see what you think the kind of key takeaways are about the roles of creatives you know, going back to the start in response to a crisis of this sort of magnitude, you know, we've touched on, um, you know, we've, 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 we've touched on the fact that you guys and a lot of your publishers are throwing in, you know, in support of charities and, you know, creating messaging, um, you know, uh, what, what should creatives be doing? You know, uh, what, what are the takeaways they should have, using your platforms for you know for good you know in 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 these sorts of crises yeah i think it's a brilliant question and it it sort of makes my mind think back to you know you know wartime rhetorics are are, are sort of relevant now somewhat with you know Mm. nhs nightingale digital dunkirk but you, you also remember like iconic things like rosie the riveter you know um we can do it or lord kishner like your country needs you i mean it's a bit a bit out there a bit cliche but it feels like that sort of time where there's an environment and there's an engaged audience and there's a way in which you can reach those people and sort of distribute and broadcast for good as opposed to buy my product x and i've never you know i've been working for 20 odd years and i haven't seen this time before so i'm really sort of excited and it's sort of i mentioned it before but that 
when when the UN wrote that brief, to me, it's like the ideal brief. For like, what do you mean we can work with the UN and we can use these sort of initiatives and mm. and we can sort of build work and, and help others? And I think that's still relevant now. And I think, you know, we're all in an uncertain world and it's going to sh- it's shifting, isn't it, week by week? You know, so we'll unlock a bit more of pseudo freedom, in air quotes. Um, and I think that's a really interesting time to think about what we can do it going forward. Because we want to have this invite. We, we don't want it to be like, oh, it was COVID-19. We, we all did this stuff. And then we just go back to how we were before. And that transcends many different things like flying and all, so on and so forth, right? I would like to continue. And I know we would as a company is to keep this, this initiative available, but perhaps it cascades through different you know, initiatives. Yeah, um, it's, going uh, forward. I mean, it's, it's interesting you say that, that we a Glug every year we try and do a glug for good project and yes. and the foundation principle is the same you know we have a network of tens of thousands of people around the world um uh, the vast majority of whom are creative professionals and every year we say right let's harness the power of that and let's see what good we can do you know last year we did a project which is called protest by design which was all about encouraging designers and creatives um, uh, uh, to use visual communication, which, as we said before, you know, is incredibly powerful, Very powerful and yeah. uh, uh, um, at, at putting a message across. And obviously, the people that we engage with and you engage with, uh, uh, you know, are, are on our teams and in our audiences are very very good at that um so we had people creating posters that were protest posters um in support of the youth climate strikes that were going on so we made a a receptacle people uploaded posters and the idea was that people gave freely of their creativity to uh, uh, to be used by others who didn't necessarily have those skills to go out and see if they can make some difference and actually interestingly we've got a, a, a project coming up we've been talking about this stuff at Glug, uh, and uh, you know i know we've touched on this before in other conversations you you said you know this notion of back to normal there's some positives actually that can be taken from everything that's gone on there are some sort of mm. social changes and some uh, opportunities to kind of just step up a little bit and change and i think we've seen that notion of community which is extraordinary right the way across um, all of our society in the UK, and I'm sure this is happening all around the world, where people are coming together and supporting each other. Um, and, and actually, we, you know, we, we've got a working title of a, a little mini campaign called Forward to Normal. So instead yeah. of Back to Normal, you know, it's for, you know, what, what is the positive step? And we'll be issuing a series of mini briefs very similar to the sort of things that you guys have been doing with the washing your hands, you know, little bits of creative response that people can give that can then be broadcast, you know, we should come and talk to you and some of your publishers about it, you know, as a, a, find a, a place for some of this stuff to go out. Um, you know, and I think that's right. It's, it's, it's something you can do. It's something that, you know, we can't necessarily all be an NHS worker or a, or a, a frontline worker. Yeah. But actually, we can be frontline in our own way, can't we, for creativity, you know. And, do you, you know, have, have you found with your team, you know, with these initiatives that you've done already, are they enga- the creatives, are they engaged with this? Is this something that you're having to brief them and tell them to do as a boss or is it something as a community people are getting behind no that's a really good question I, I i echo everything you say by the way and share your sentiments um no absolutely not it's it's quite fascinating actually as it's sort of developed over time you're sort of seeing you know a guy a guy in my team became the spearhead from creative labs and people at reaching out to him internally within the company saying this is really cool i've never been so proud of the company and being able to do something how can i play my part and you know, and with with lines like I'll, I'll do this outside of my normal job, you know, I just want to play a part. And I think that is exactly the sort of thing that goes back to your point about we're not key workers in that descriptor of traditional, but we are able to be act like that and get that same sort of effort reward response. Yeah. And I think that's amazing, right? It's phenomenally powerful. I mean, I've said this quite a few times over the course of the last year, talking specifically about protest by design that we did last year. Yeah. You know, Greta Thunberg, uh, uh, not that long ago, a couple of years ago, sat outside the Swedish parliament striking for the climate. And yeah. the thing that made that resonate was the fact that she had a poster next to her that actually explained that. So very, very visual, mm-hmm. you know, and frankly, and probably being slightly glib about it, but nonetheless, a photograph of Greta Thunberg sat outside the, the Swedish parliament on her own without a poster is just a little girl next to a building. Yeah. But you add that visual communication and suddenly there's a strong message. And that's powerful, right? That's really exciting. Yeah. 
you know, I think I think that that's a and it's still yeah, used, it's, right? It's the same poster is used at every sort of place, however long later. It's incredible. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. because and 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 again, you take that into a non-linguistic communication, and that's even more global. No one's going to translate a poster, you know, that's yes. just got a very very good infographic on it that yes. tells you about something positive. Great. Well, I mean, I think that's a that's a really nice positive uh, 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 way, for end, us, right? yeah. way for us to finish. You know, <laughs> uh, there's, there's lots to be taken out. Um, so it just remains for me to say thank you, Sai, very, very much. Uh, Sai Crowhurst, VP of Young Fungal Creative Labs. Uh, this has been Glug's Creative Lunch Hour as part of Media Tell Events, Future of Gaming. Thanks ever so much. Pleasure. Thanks very much. <laughs>